Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us this morning for the uh, Soil Health Institute's uh, announcement and uh, the work that's uh, moving forward to here. Um, my name is Bruce Knight. Um, I am principal uh, and uh, founder of a small firm called Strategic Conservation Solutions. Um, had worked in the conservation field uh, all my life as a farmer rancher from South Dakota, as former chief of NRCS. And, uh, but uh, I'm here today because of a personal passion I and others share, and many of those folks are in this room. And that personal passion was about how to put science into the soil health movement and how to really move soil health forward as a principle in the, uh, in the conservation community. And it seems like it was three plus years ago that several of us had a chance because of the vision of uh, Bill Buckner at uh, the Noble Foundation to gather at uh, his headquarters in Ardmore and have that first dream session. And from that session developed a, a strategic plan of how to move forward on soil health. And from that was born what is now the uh, Soil Health Institute. And uh, we've got... Uh, before you and we'll share with you today that plan, that vision, and the people that are, uh, that are involved in that. Um, for those opening comments, uh, and to kick things off, I would like to uh, bring forth and introduce to you uh, Bill Buckner, uh, President and CEO of the uh, Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation. It's an independent, nonprofit institute based in Ardmore, Oklahoma, and it's one of the most innovative, progressive, conservation-oriented foundations that uh, up until a few years ago, most of you had never heard of. Um, but uh, the team of scientists is outstanding. The amount of work that goes on there is outstanding. And uh, the vision that they've brought in that relationship based on the dirty 30s and the legacy from um, Oklahoma as the epicenter of the Dust Bowl to where we can come today in soil health has really been a founding for that. Uh, Bill is former CEO of Bear Corporation, so he brings with him this commitment to soil health with a desire to work at the speed and pace of commerce. And I tell you, that has been a fantastic thing to watch as we have moved forward with that. And without any further ado, I want to introduce Bill Buckner. I don't think Bruce has that quite right. I've, I've learned to march at the speed of Bruce Knight. <laughs> and, uh, because he certainly keeps me challenged at times. But um, thank you, Bruce, for those great comments. And good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us and for those that are streaming online. You know, in the 13th century, Leonardo da Vinci said that we know more about the movement of the celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. One of our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, understood the importance of soil when he said, the people are in truth the only legitimate proprietors of the soil and the government. With the Morrell Act of 1862, Abraham Lincoln recognized the growing importance of rural education and more importantly, the need to advance our understanding of agriculture and mechanical engineering and created what is now broadly known today as our land-grant college system. In the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt proclaimed that the nation that destroys soil destroys itself. And in the 1930s, Hugh Bennett, the first leader of what is known today as the Natural Resource and Conservation Service, said this, if this is to be a permanent nation, we must save this most indispensable of all our God-given assets, the soil, from which comes our food and raiment. If we fail in this, remember that much sooner than we have expected, this will be a nation of subsoil farmers. In the 1930s, the Farm Foundation was created to begin addressing many of the agricultural issues impacting our nation. Also during this decade, the NRCS and the conservation districts were created to begin addressing the pressing issues of soil and water conservation across the country. Later in this same decade, the Noble Foundation's founder, Lloyd Noble, a very successful oilman from Ardmore, Oklahoma, proclaimed, the land must continue to provide for food, shelter, and clothing long after the oil is gone. 
profound statement from an oilman who understood the intrinsic finite value of our natural resources. Coming out of the Dust Bowl, a common saying among Oklahoma farmers at this time was, one for the blackbird, one for the crow, one for the cutworm, and one to grow. The statement reveals the hardships farmers from across this land felt as they struggled as, as a subsoil farming unit to grow a crop. In 1945, Lloyd Noble started the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation, and he said, being naturally interested in soil, because of our background, this is where we start. And as the world began to heal itself following World War II, GIs from the farm and ranch returned to their roots to begin putting their lives back together and to feed a nation. Huge advances in agricultural technologies, from machinery to seed to crop protection chemicals and new fertilizers provided the nation's growers the needed tools to feed a nation and ultimately the world whereby modern agriculture technologies have saved perhaps millions of lives around the world. After the war, the science of agriculture was off to a great start as scientists in ag extension began the slow process of educating growers on how to repair the soil. By the 1960s, the ranks of students entering the land-grant colleges began to swell and the competing interest of animal and plant science began to overtake the interest of soil science. The green revolution that followed was a revolution like no other in its time in agricultural history. In the 1980s, drought, declining commodity prices, and skyrocketing interest rates took a toll on the agricultural landscape. Many innovative farmers and technology companies around the country began to look at their farming operations differently. They recognized that the way they'd been farming the last 20 to 30 years was not sustainable and began looking at different methods in order to reduce input costs, time and labor and reduce erosion and soil compaction. Drainage tiles, center pivot irrigation, minimum tillage all expanded greatly along with further advancements in seed, fertilizer and crop protection chemicals. Between the 1980s and 2010, your early, early experimenting farmers and ranchers across the country began to look at the soil differently. Reaching back to the soil and agronomy books, published and written in the late 1800s and early 1900s, they began the practice of regenerative farming, recognizing that being a subsoil farmer was not sustainable given the changing environmental conditions, rising input costs, and, and an increasing level consu of consumer activism concerned about the environment and the quality of their food. So in November 2013, a group of agriculturalists from government, academia, NGOs, farmers and ranchers, both organic and conventional, met in Ardmore, Oklahoma with the specific mission of reawakening the public to the importance of soil health for enhancing healthy, profitable, and sustainable natural resource systems. This effort was called the Soil Renaissance and was funded by the two oldest agricultural foundations in America, the Farm Foundation and the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation. The volunteer numbers of participants in the Soil Renaissance quickly grew from 25 to over 150 volunteers. Their charge? to put together a high-level strategic roadmap that would link together the efforts of other initiatives already started, primarily the Soil Science Society initiatives, NRCS, and the Soil Health Partnership created by the National Corn Growers Association. And with that, by improving and enhancing our nation's soils. But before we could be successful to do this, there was a tremendous amount of grunt work that needed to be done to create the foundation and baseline from which all of the science and related technologies would evolve. What started out as a three-year project was now looking like a never-ending effort to execute on the strategic roadmap, build the volunteer ranks, and raise the necessary capital to advance the science and understanding of soil health now and forever. So with a $20 million, 10-year investment and a commitment from the Noble Foundation and ongoing support from the Farm Foundation, the Soil Health Institute was created and launched in December 2015. To ensure proper governance and stewardship of the new institute, a strategically crafted board was created. This board is comprised of science and technology leaders from both the conventional, conventional and organic sides of agriculture, representatives of our soil testing labs and professional societies, our conservation districts, leaders in policy and advocacy, and last but certainly not least, farmers and ranchers, both organic and conventional. Each board member is dedicated to steering the evolution and understanding of soil health in support of our vision, which is 
to be the primary resource for soil health information and research, whose outcomes will yield healthy, sustainable soils to serve as the foundation for society, benefit the environment, and contribute to the productivity and profitability of agriculture. With the rollout of today's strategic action plan created by concerned agriculturalists from across the country in the ag sector, and with the ongoing support of NRCS, NACD, the Soil Science Society, our nation's testing lab, soil testing labs, our land-grant institutions, and financial support from private, public, and corporate foundations, family offices, NGOs, government entities, and volunteers, and with new technologies developed by the new Aggies from Silicon Valley, RTP, Boston, and other tech centers and incubators from around the world, we'll finally start the process in earnest seven centuries later of understanding more about the biological life underground more than we do the heavens above. The Soil Health Institute will be to soil what NASA is to space. With your ongoing support and encouragement, we will continue this ambitious challenge. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll turn it back to you, Bruce. Thank you, Bill. We'll bring uh, each of the speakers up and then uh, and speak, and then we'll uh, do a panel at the end and take any questions from folks as uh, as we come at that uh, that point in time. Um, next up, I want to introduce to you uh, a gentleman who, over the last several years, has become a a, a great friend, a, a colleague, and a and a mentor all at the same time to me, and um, and that is Dr. Wayne Honeycutt. Uh, he is now the president and CEO of the Soil Health Institute. Um, prior to joining SHI and really helping us give birth and launch to SHI. Um, he was the uh, Deputy Chief for Science and Technology at the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And uh, uh, he'd often at that time remind me that, uh, Bruce, I, I no longer work for you. And uh, now, because he's as, at SHI and I'm on the board along with Bill and everybody else, I can say, uh, yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, he has a long-standing career in leadership in soil health. Uh, uh, Dr. Honeycutt, uh, before he's with NRCS, was at ARS, leading the, uh, the soils team there, and really brings to us the depth and experience and the science that we've been looking for and how to bring, uh, bring that, uh, that forth. Now, uh, Dr. Honeycutt, experience in NRCS, experience in ARS, uh, is grounded in roots in a, uh, in a farm in Kentucky, which brings that, that unique blend of Kentucky wisdom, the experience of, uh, of working in these federal agencies, and now a desire to move at the, uh, at the pace of commerce. So with that, Dr. Honeycutt. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, such a real pleasure to see so many smiling faces that showed up today. We really appreciate it. Uh, before I get going, I want to just very briefly express my sincere appreciation to a number of organizations and individuals, uh, particularly the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation and for their support and commitment that you just heard Bill Buckner speak about. But also Bill, of course, himself being the visionary for the Soil Health Institute and now is the uh, ongoing uh, uh, chair of our board for the Soil Health Institute. We do have a number of board members here, Andy Levine from the American Seed Trade Association, uh, of course uh, Bruce Knight uh, with Strategic Conservation Solutions, Bill Buckner I mentioned. Uh, let me see, did I, did I miss anybody else that's on the board that's here? I believe, uh, I believe that's it. Uh, but listen, um, I really also want to express my appreciation to the uh, Soil Health Institute staff it's been working very diligently uh, for almost a year now. I think we got a quite a bit accomplished in that short period of time. Uh, Dr. Steve Schaefer is here with our Chief Scientific Officer, Sheldon Jones, our Chief Operations Officer, Byron Rath, who is our um, Assistant Communications Specialist. And uh, also we have uh, Sydney uh, Reynolds, who is with the Signature Agency that's on our uh, communications team. And then I also want to reach out to our partners, recognize our partners. Of course, we'll be hearing from them a little bit later on this morning, but it's really become quite evident that for us to achieve um, soil health at scale, 
it's really going to require a lot of very strategic partnerships, very well orchestrated partnerships uh, along the way. And so we're just really excited and appreciate, you know, them coming today and uh, just kind of being a, a representation of a broad mix of partnerships that have already been developed. And then, of course, the stakeholders that you also heard about, Bill Buckner mentioned, that really contributed a lot of their ideas and expertise into the formation of the action plan. So thanks to all those groups. So this is an exciting time, uh, not just for the Institute staff, but it's an exciting time to be working in soil health. And that's because, as you can see from the breadth of the diversity of individuals and organizations that we've already mentioned and that are here today, it's really become increasingly recognized that soil health represents one of those rare win-win situations where what is good for the farm and the farmer and the rancher is also good for the environment. But at the same time, we know that to achieve further advances in soil health, it really does require that science-based information to provide those farmers and ranchers. So that's what we're really all about at the, at the Soil Health Institute. Now, when we developed our action plan, I'll tell you, we thought about it for a few days, what we really wanted to title it. And when we came up with Enriching Soil, Enhancing Life, it really resonated with us. And that's because when you enrich soil, you do enhance life on so many different levels, from the microscopic to the ecosystem level. We know, just, we'll just take one example of some soil health measure, and there's many different measures, but one of the most global measures is soil organic matter, usually measured as soil organic carbon, because it's more accurate to measure it as carbon. But, you know, it's what imparts that black color, the dark color to soils. We know that when we increase organic carbon, we stimulate microbial activity in soil. Well, what does that ha happen? What happens there? When the microorganisms feed on that carbon as their energy source, where they're releasing nitrogen and phosphorus for plants, for plant life. They're enhancing plant life. We also know that when we grow different types of species of like cover crops together, that we're stimulating different types of microbial communities in that biodiversity. What that can do is it can build pest suppression, actual build disease suppression in those soils because of that biodiversity in the microbial communities. So again, enhancing the plant life. Another thing about organic carbon is when you add, increase organic carbon in your soil, you can increase the actual available water holding capacity of your soil. By our calculations, when you increase the organic carbon just by 1%, then you increase the available water holding capacity in the soil anywhere from 2,500 to 12,000 gallons per acre in just in the top six inches. Now, so think what that means to the livelihood of the farmer and his or her family that's making a living off that piece of land. Now think of what, how we all benefit as the folks that eat that produce, that eat the food that's coming off the farm and the animals that's grazing it, et cetera. Think of the life that that gives to us, what that does for our livelihoods. And it's not just the food. It's not just the, um, just the, the plentiful supply of affordable, nutritious food that that gives us. And that's huge, right? But it's also thinking of that's because of that resilience that that farmer now has incorporated into his or her system, that really allows them to be more economically viable for extended periods of time. So it helps sustain our rural landscapes that all of us enjoy. And that wildlife, those people, those creatures that are sharing this world with us, that they also depend on. So there's so many connections here of to enhancing, enriching soil and to enhancing life. Now, while a lot of these relationships like that I've just talked about are well known or well documented, there's so many more that really need to be further discovered, further developed and also adopted. And so therein lies the action plan for soil health. With a lot of the stakeholder input that Bill mentioned, what we've done is the, the action plan identifies critical goals and priorities. It um, helps identify key gaps in our knowledge and in our implementation. And then what we're happiest about, what we really strive to struggle with, but what we developed in the end, and what you have in front of you, if you picked it up this morning, it's also available on our website as of today, 
is we've identified specific actionable steps to achieve these things, to address these gaps in knowledge and adoption. Just quick examples. In the research arena, it identifies specific steps to enhance water holding capacity, increase water infiltration. When we increase water infiltration, well, there's less nutrients running off to our waterways. Reduces greenhouse gas emissions, increase carbon sequestration, build that disease suppressive suppressiveness in our soils. One of the things I'm really most excited about also that you'll find in the action plan is exploring something that I know very, very little about. And, and that's, I guess, one of the most exciting things about it. And that is this relationship between soil health and human health. It's largely untapped, but it doesn't take too much imagination to start thinking of what those connectivities can be and what those opportunities are. But while we focus a lot on research, can someone get that cricket? <laughs> well, while we focus Sorry. a lot on research in this plan, I also want to make sure that folks realize that we also recognize that there are bridges to getting that research adopted. And so we've also addressed those. Things like economics. We know farmers and ranchers are businessmen and women at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. So it has to be economically viable for them. And so we've identified specific actionable steps to quantify the profitability of these soil promoting, soil health promoting practices and systems. But then we don't just stop there. We also say, okay, now let's take that research information and now let's ground truth it with farmers. So there's a step in there for ground truth in it. Does this, does this resonate with you? Is this real for you and your system, your production system, your climate zone, your soils? And then we take an additional step, once it's ground truth, to make sure it's disseminated through so many of the partnerships that are in this room right now, like with NRCS, National Association of Conservation Dis Districts, the Ag Retailers Association, Certified Crop Advisors, you know, uh, so many, so many more. So that's part of the economic equation and picture, but there's others. I talked about building resilience, things like increasing water holding capacity. Well, we know through that 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 should reduce economic risk. It should lead to greater yield stability. And so thanks to a recent grant from the Walton Family Foundation, we're starting to quantify that. There are a number of other areas in the action plan, and I won't go into as much detail uh, with some of those others, but another real key one is measurements. We know that if farmers and ranchers are given the tools they need and the and the scientists can come together on how to interpret what these right soil health measurements are within the context of a given crop and system and climate and soil properties, then it can really go a long way to helping farmers and ranchers understand what additional gains that they might be able to, to make. We think that this type of work can also lead to a national soil health assessment. And if we can conduct that national soil health assessment, then that will not only allow us to assess the current state of soil health in the country, but it now then would allow us to project with like using our models, okay, if we're at this level and we raise soil health to a certain level, now what are the additional environmental benefits? What does that mean to the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico, for example? What does that mean to the additional productivity that, that can be gained? Communications and education is another big area, obviously, where we want to be that resource for soil health information for the larger soil science and, and practitioner community. And then, of course, in the policy area, we want to make sure that all of the policies are well informed to support all of these advances. So all of these things, they require partnerships, but it's also clear that they will require resources. But I guess I would throw out to you that isn't it worth it because what we're really talking about here is enhancing life. And I guess I also want to tell you that I'm not going to be too bashful about trying to seek and acquire those resources for distribution to the scientific and the practitioner communities because I, we don't really have the luxury of time anymore. In 33 years, just by the year 2050, only 33 years away, there are going to be another 
there is going to be another two billion people on this earth to feed. And at the same time that we need to grow all this additional food to feed that burgeoning population, we're losing land at an, at an alarming rate. Farmers are increasingly challenged to deal with more and more extreme weather events, all the way from drought to heavy precipitation. And we also know that there are some significant environmental issues that need to be addressed. Things like that hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico, issues in the Chesapeake Bay and the Western Lake Erie Basin. But the beauty of soil health is that by focusing on soil health is it allows us to simultaneously address all of these challenges. So I would suggest to you that the time is now. And now we have a detailed plan to follow. And so let's get to it. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Dr. Honeycutt. And uh, remind everyone that we'll be uh, able to field uh, questions to Dr. Honeycutt and the entire team in, in just a, uh, a few minutes. Now, Dr. Honeycutt also mentioned that uh, the primary focus on this are the private landowners who actually farm, till, manage the soil. That uh, soil health can't occur and doesn't occur unless the private landowners who actually uh, hold title to that, that property and manage it and steward it um, are able to uh, have a component in return from soil health. With that, I'm going to introduce to you a, uh, a gentleman who over the last several years has become a, a close friend and somebody I admire uh, greatly, uh, Keith Alverson. Keith is from uh, Chester, South Dakota, serves on the board of directors for the National Corn Growers Association, um, as well as serving on the board for Field to Market. And so uh, he's providing his input, his leadership and experience in one of the key trade associations in this community from the farmer side as well as one of the key trade associations or one of the key platforms, if you will, for field to market. Now, Keith is, I've gotten to know him and understand a little bit more about um, his operation, truly brings to bear that innovation, that spark of creativity, that willingness to try new things on his own operation that is, is so instrumental to where we're going with, uh, with soil health and, and how we're moving forward with that. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Keith Alverson. Thanks, Bruce. Um, <clears throat> I noticed as Bruce approached this morning that <clears throat> I was appreciative that my uh, seven-year-old picked out this blue tie instead of blue tie that would match Bruce's. Otherwise, we would have left everybody with the impression that, uh, that we have some sort of dress code coming out of South Dakota. But uh, thank you. It's, it's a privilege to be here, uh, here representing National Corn Growers Association, as well as talking a little bit about the Soil Health Partnership, and uh, then definitely from the farm perspective. And so uh, NCGA is, is fully committed to sustainability and soil health. And that's one of the reasons that uh, we were one of the, the, the founding uh, partners that helped create the Soil Health Partnership back in 2014. So it's great to see that uh, more organizations with the sole focus of uh, soil health effort are being created and uh, it's taking its rightful place in the agriculture and environmental uh, priorities across the country. So a little bit more about myself. Um, in 1879, uh, my third great-grandfather moved from southern Minnesota and settled on the banks of Skunk Creek, just west of the present site of Chester, South Dakota, when uh, it was still tall grass prairie. And uh, I'm proud to be the sixth generation of my family that's farmed in that area. And one of the core principles that's been passed down from generation to generation is that uh, if you take care of the soil, the soil will take care of you, and that uh, we should be stewards of the land to take uh, take care of it and leave it better for the next generation than you found it. And obviously that uh, involves using the best technology and best knowledge of the time. And you know, when we can look back and connect the dots throughout our history, 
Sometimes that doesn't always paint the rosiest picture as we went through the, the days of using plows to, to plow up the prairie and change the landscape and the loss of the organic matter that's so incredibly valuable as Dr. Honeycutt talked about. Um, but uh, that's something that's been instilled in me and I, I think that uh, we've tried to embrace that on our farm in using the best information at the time and uh, you know, trying to, to remain on the forefront of in adapting new technologies in order to improve our soils for, for the next generation. And so uh, a little bit more about myself. I graduated South Dakota State University in 2002 and came back to the family farm operation, joining my dad and uncle. Uh, we've grown and now I'm, I'm the primary operator of about 2,500 acres of a mix of irrigated and non-irrigated ground of glacial outwash and glacial till in southeast South Dakota near Chester. Uh, the crop mix is about two-thirds to three-quarters uh, corn, uh, with the remainder being in soybeans. And some of the things that we've embraced um, throughout our, our, our operation is uh, for our management of nutrients to try and be uh, the best stewards as we can uh, to the environment around us. Uh, the irrigated ground that we have uh, has a fair amount of gravel, and so it's susceptible to nutrient leaching and so uh, split applications and variable rate applications is something that we've been doing since the early 90s uh, to try and uh, limit any potential loss that we would have to the environment because we know that's not good for the economics of the farm, nor is it good for the environment around us. We've also uh, tried to be uh, early adopters of all precision technology because we believe that uh, the, you know, placing nutrients, placing seeds in the right place at the right time and uh, where, where they can best be optimized is something important in order to be a steward. Um, one of the other things that uh, the irrigated portion of the farm helped initiate for my dad and, and uncle was that uh, we wanted to, to reduce the amount or, or reduce the tillage intensity that we had on the farm. Common practice at the time that the irrigation was installed was uh, high impact sprinklers on the center pivot systems. And it, and it created water runoff that they didn't like to see. And so they moved from the plow to a system called ridge till to leave the residue on the surface and help manage that corn residue. And, and that's something that uh, we've continued until this day and uh, certainly anticipate using in the foreseeable future because of the benefits that it provides to uh, the earthworm population and, and, and just uh, having that no-till type environment but yet uh, being able to manage the residue in a corn corn and soybean crop mix uh, in our part of the state. Um, one of the things that I, I was wondering to myself uh, when, when this all began, if I was going to be talking about the things uh, that, that were going to fit into the puzzle um, in the soil health plan. And uh, when Dr. Honeycutt started talking about organic matter, I thought, you know, this is, this is really ideal. And because this is one of the things that we've focused in on our farm is the measurement and tracking of organic matter levels throughout the years. Um, we saw from when we, we moved from the plow and went to a reduction in tillage and uh, started growing higher yielding corn, uh, that that residue returning back to the soil was actually building our organic matter levels. And uh, actually a couple years ago, we hired a firm to do some intensive testing from the, the zero to 36 inch range and found that uh, our organic matter levels have increased over the past uh, 30 plus years of ridge till and, and uh, you know, corn soybean uh, farming, uh, about one and a half percent overall, uh, which is really quite, quite startling because we start talking about the, the numbers, the water holding capacity and the resiliency that's created through that. Um, one of the numbers that I had seen, and maybe it's a Soil Health Institute number, is that each percentage of increase in organic matter can hold about 1.43 acre inches of water. And so as we go through the, the math of that, you talk to the, some of the seed trait providers and they say that modern corn hybrids uh, can produce about 10 bushels of grain for every inch of water that you provide the crop. So that 1.5% increase in organic matter times the 1.43 acre inches of water equates to about 20 bushels the acre of added production capacity that we see on an annual basis on our farm. And so, you know, when we look at, uh, you know, even the modest uh, futures price of grain right now, you know, hovering just below $4 to bushel, it's pretty significant income and revenue, you know, in addition to the nutrient holding capacity, the mineralization capacity that we have through that increase in organic matter. 
And so that's something that's really exciting to us and uh, exciting to see about, you know, as we grow the bigger yields, we're returning more residue to the soil. What kind of potential does that create? Uh, so some other things that we've worked on, uh, we've done some experimentation with cover crops. We're excited about the opportunity. We haven't quite found a, a mix that works uh, being that far north. It's been a challenge to try and get something established after we take off our corn crop. Um, but uh, it's something we're excited about adding that and adding uh, more feed to the mycorrhiza and, and uh, the microbes within the system. Um, and, and really just wanted to relay that, you know, we as farmers uh, realize that uh, a healthy soil is really the lifeblood uh, to what we have going on. It goes back to, you know, if we provide and feed the soil, then that's going to provide for us as a family and as a farm, uh, farm community. And, and uh, you know, my story, it's a privilege to be able to share my story about, you know, how soil health has been a focus of our farm. Uh, but it's one of many that could be said across, uh, across the Corn Belt and across uh, agriculture in the U.S. I know in South Dakota we've got uh, other, other groups working on soil health as a community. We've got uh, the so South Dakota Soil Health Coalition that's really embracing the information that's learned from, from institutions like the Soil Health Institute um, and trying to adapt those on, on farm scale. But, uh, you know, it's my story is one of many that could be said about farmers adopting conservation practices and, and focusing in on soil health. And really the information sharing is going to be incredibly valuable because, uh, you know, with the sharing that we, we have and how quickly these things can be adopted uh, nowadays it is going to be beneficial to us on the farm level uh, and, and those of us, all of us uh, interested in agriculture and forwarding uh, the, the health of our soil and our environment. Just a little bit more about the Soil Health Partnership. Uh, it's been recognized as a national leader in the soil health movement and uh, being able to communicate soil health issues and, and information and data uh, from farmer to farmer. And what we've done is we set up a, a network of, of demonstration farms and we've really taken the research farm type approach and brought it to a field level using GIS technology and so that um, we've got over over a hundred farms across the United States right now that have been able to do that and so it's uh, documenting practice changes uh, and comparing those to the current practices things like uh, cover crops nutrient management, uh, conservation tillage have been the ones, you know, that we, we realize are just the tip of the iceberg on these things, but uh, some of the easy changes to, to try on, on, on the first, uh, first go around with this and then with the intention of adding uh, some of the complexity and the things that we learned throughout the process in all this. But uh, the information is gathered and then really uh, distributed farmer to farmer and field days uh, collected and with the intent of, of having it published as, as uh, scientific data down the road once enough information is collected. And so uh, we're really excited to be working with groups like the Soil Health Institute and are confident that, uh, you know, as strides are made, uh, you know, we're going to continue to see progress that's going to provide benefit back to our farmers uh, and back to those of us on the farm to improve soil health, improve our environmental sustainability. and. Uh, all the impacts that, are, that, are, that go along with it. And so uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's a real privilege to be here as, as a farmer and uh, here representing NCGA. Thank you very much, uh, Keith. And uh, yeah, I think you can see uh, why I, uh, I appreciate so much his passion for the uh, work that uh, he's doing in the leadership that Keith is providing in this area as an example of what hundreds and hundreds of thousands of farmers are doing around the, around the country in this area. Now, Keith also spoke about that partnership that we have between the Soil Health Institute and the Soil Health Partnership, and two organizations working alongside each other, each with a, with a mission and a vision that is complementary in building on that. And that's what's key to conservation and it's key to the success long term of this. Uh, another partner that we work with very closely is the Natural Resources Conservation Service. That same sort of intertwining, except in this time, in this case, it's the relationship between Soil Health Institute and SHP 
um, as private entities and government and the federal government and the work that's done through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, I mentioned to you all earlier that I was uh, formerly chief of, uh, of NRCS. When, during that time, um, I got to know a number of state conservationists who I could lean on for straight advice, good counsel, and practical knowledge about how to service the farmers and ranchers around the country. Uh, one of those gentlemen that I got to know was uh, the young state conservationist that was in Georgia that was uh, working on, on things and could always uh, shoot me squarely with the advice that I needed to know and not the advice I wanted to hear. And uh, um, his name is Leonard Jordan. Now, Leonard is uh, no longer state conservationist in, uh, in NRCS in Georgia. Uh, we brought him to headquarters, and uh, he served in a number of roles there, but uh, most recently he was the associate chief for conservation in charge of putting all those programs on the ground. And now he is the acting chief of NRCS, and with that I bring you Chief Leonard Jordan. Good morning. I was really terrified of what Bruce <laughs> may have said. There were there was different directions he could have gone, but but he did, and I'm so appreciative of that my prayers last night uh, ans were answered. Uh, it is an honor for me and to, to represent NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, with this partnership today. Uh, I consider it to be a, a great day for agriculture. I consider it to be a great day for conservation and especially a great day for a, a soil conservationist such as, such as I. Uh, Bruce made reference to the young state conservationists in Georgia. And then uh, he, but he let me off the hook because he could have said, now the older person uh, <laughs> that, that resided in the headquarters. Bruce brought me to DC, so you can thank him or you can curse him later, whatever your, your preference may be. But anyway, uh, it is an honor for us to participate in this historical event. Thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Honecutt and all the other great partners. We, we look forward to the partnership, the collaboration. As things move forward, we do indeed support wholeheartedly the efforts here, and, and uh, we, we're willing to co collaborate uh, to the extent that we can. And of course, in any partnership and all partnership, they have roles and responsibilities, and we will do it, and it's just a joy to collaborate with like minds and those that are interested in, in the same objective. And, and I think there's definite alignment here, and uh, we're all in. Uh, but it began for us as a Soil Conservation Service some 80 years ago, and it feel like I've been around about that time. And, and uh, now the Natural Resource Conservation So we are, we're proud of the fact that we have uh, produced, we work with producers, private individuals, around the country to make great investments in their operations. Uh, investment that has led to um, stability, has led to uh, the local and rural economies, and, and above all, resiliency of their farms, their communities, and it rolled up into this, this nation. We've, we feel honored to have uh, served in that capacity along with the districts and the other partners. That we think that's substantial. And as it was referred to, I think, by Dr. Buckner, uh, that he talked about the Dust Bowl, and as an agency, as the story goes, we, we arrived as a result of the Dust Bowl. And uh, we, have, we feel good about the efforts that we have uh, worked with our districts and other partners and providing the much needed assistance around the country to private producers to help overcome the, the challenges that was the resulted from the Dust Bowl. And today, we find ourselves in an enviable situation for the rest of the world because of those, those conservation efforts. So those are efforts that we feel good about and all of you should feel equally uh, good about. Uh, you know, American farmers and ranchers are uh, excellent stewards. I, I think we all can rally around that and they, they actually care about the land and they rely on the land for their livelihood. And it is very important. And uh, the farmers and the local conservation districts and other partners, they, they really done a great job of providing the examples of what good stewardship 
is and can be and the results of those efforts and how beneficial those efforts are to their, their communities and again, the country. But uh, led by those producers, we are expanded uh, from beyond what we did some years ago, and that is our primary focus was of course on soil erosion and, and soil loss. We were expanding, we're learning from those producers that, and it, someone made the statement, if you take care of the land, you take care of the soil, it will indeed take care of you. So they have proved to us that if they put a little bit more attention on creating a better environment, a better healthy conditions within the soils, good things come as a result of that. So we, we applaud those efforts and, and we follow their lead and we now are beginning to uh, work in a partnership effort to take a look at how we can fine tune our assistance, our tools, to put more focus on that living soil and how we can invest in, in that critical, that vital, uh, something that matters, and all of the various benefits that come from healthy soil. You know, I know that from a healthy soil we get, uh, and it's been referenced, we get uh, greater infiltration, and we get greater what? Water storage. I think from healthy soil we get healthier food, healthier plants, that, that all of us as societies, the members of society, uh, rely upon. From, from a healthy soil, it helps to reduce cost. The producer's input cost, it helps to reduce cost, and it helps to mitigate risk to, to producers. Uh, we know that, uh, that uh, when we invest in, in soil and the health of the soil, and I think as we mentioned earlier, all of society, you know, the producers on the lands, but all of societies are beneficiaries of that investment. And as it pertains to us as an agency, we work with those producers. So as those producers incorporate into their operation those tools and those opportunities to enhance that living organism, the soil, all of society benefit. And sometimes I feel that it's a, it's a well-kept secret uh, in terms of how all of society, whether rural, urban, whatever the case may be, how all of society truly benefit from the decisions that the local producers make on their operations of, across this country. I think you know that, but there may be some across the country that's not aware of that. And I think I take this opportunity today to say that all of society benefit, and then we need to find ways to better leverage and better participate and the efforts that continually to try to enhance the, the abilities of, of the soil. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of programs and, and we are proud that the Farm Bill has afforded us as an agency with a suite of, of programs by which we can work and, and integrate into the producer's operations from which they make informed decisions, and most of those decisions goes to trying to improve the health of their soil. One of the programs, though, that I, I want to highlight, though, that I think has, has really served a key and a pivotal role is the Resource Conservation Partnership Program. You've heard about that, I'm sure. And nobody raised their hand, but my assumption is silence represent you agree. Uh, so we've heard about it, and through that program, uh, we've had, I think over the last few years, we've invested some $24 million in some roughly around 23 different proposals that was solely focused on soil health. And, and we think that that has been quite uh, beneficial. But the more important part is that over that time frame, we've worked with some 200 partners that all had a keen interest in advancing the efforts of improving soil health. And those 200 partners have levied, leveraged some 33 million additional dollars with that focus on the improvement of soil health and providing those opportunities to the producers around the country so they can continue to put in practice those, those soil health practices that goes a long ways of, of, of again addressing the topic for which we are here to celebrate today, and that is soil health. We, we know that the, the job of 
enhancing and, and maintaining the nation's soil is huge. And it's, it's too huge, too large, too huge, that's not proper, is it? But it's too large for any one entity. And, and that's why I think this, this public and private partnership that we are addressing today is, is critical, critical, important, and it's essential. And I was talking to, maybe it was Dr. Buckner, it would, wouldn't be Wayne Honeycutt, we talked to Dr. Buckner this morning about, it's, it just makes sense. You know, why should one entity try to occupy the lanes themselves when there are so many others that have a similar interest in the same objective. So it just makes sense. The public and private partnerships make sense. And we as an agency, we want to embrace it. We want to be an instrumental player. And we want to do all that we can to, to collaborate with all of you and others that are not here to continue to move forward with the soil health effort. Uh, we, we've partnered with a lot of different groups, NACD, uh, the Nature Conservancy, Field to Market, Fertilizer Institute, and the list goes on and on and on. And, and we feel that, that those combined, those collaborative efforts are substantial today and will be even more substantial in the future. So we are proud to be a part of the Coordinating Coalition for Soil Health, and I want to especially thank Dr. Honeycutt, that taught me a lot of things in the years that he was with NRCS. Uh, that I want to thank him and the Soil Health Institute, Bill and others for this great effort, pulling together all of these partners, rallying around something that I think is a game changer for all of society. And again, I just want to reiterate USDA's and NRCS commitment to doing something that is revolutionizing for this country. In order for us to continue to feed that growing population with reduced land, it will rely on our intelligence of contributing all of our efforts and resources to the extent that we can to this soil health concept. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And uh, we're committed. We're in the game with you, all right? Thank you so much, Chief Jordan, and we really appreciate that, that partnership. Um, next up to speak to us is, uh, is uh, Jerry Lynch. Jerry is Vice President, Chief Sustainability Office, uh, Officer at General Mills, and this includes their global sustainability efforts. Now, I've just gotten to know Jerry a little bit over the last year or so, but you know, growing up in South Dakota, um, I've known his brand since birth, you know. Um, as a matter of fact, I learned to read because of General Mills. Um, so so you, watch, you watch TV and people would gather their morning paper and they'd sit and they'd have breakfast reading the morning paper. Well, in Gann Valley, South Dakota, the paper didn't come until the afternoon and it was a day late at that time. Uh, so I grew up reading the box or the back of the box of all of your fine products. And so uh, I have a, uh, that's, there's a definition of sustainability there that I don't think you've ever, uh, you've ever heard before, Jerry. Um, uh, Jerry is really bringing a lot of vision and innovation to this movement in conservation and in sustainability. It's been watch, enjoyable to watch as he stepped into this role and really come forward with this. Um, he has been with General Mills since 1995 working in several different areas, now, uh, now the uh, sustainability efforts. So with that, Jerry Lynch. We'll take that back to our cereal division and that'll be our next <laughs> marketing platform. Thank you, Bruce, for the introduction. And thanks, Bill and Wayne, for inviting me to be here. We're, we're very excited uh, to be here for the launch of this action plan because it is aligned with our mission of serving the world by making food that people love. We are a food company. We sell a little bit over $17 billion worth of food globally every year. And thriving farm communities and a healthy planet are absolutely critical to our business model. 
if you think about it, we take the output of Mother Nature, the ingredients that she produces, and we transform it into the nutrition that consumers need in the midst of their busy lives. And so this is vitally important work for us. Uh, we focus on four key areas in our sustainability work. Thriving farmer livelihoods, supporting healthy ecosystems, stable climate, and healthy watersheds. And the reason why we're so excited about soil health and the action plan that Wayne's team has brought forward is because soil health works against all those in a very positive way, as has been talked about here this morning. And it's a very difficult in this work, uh, which can get very complex sometimes, to find a sweet spot like this that can work both economically and environmentally towards so many beneficial outcomes, as has already been talked about this morning, but I'll just name a few more. The profitability, productivity, and resilience of farms and farm communities. The healthy function of ecosystems the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and the sequestration of carbon in the soil, and healthy, resilient watersheds. I think the action plan probably states it the best when it talks about its case for soil health and says, soil is the living foundation of all ecosystems. And despite farmers and ranchers' dedication to maintaining productive lands, much of our world's remaining arable soil is steadily degrading, and so we've got a real challenge in front of us. Uh, but we're very excited about the action plan, which is a milestone, as Bill has mentioned before, in four years of work that was first started by the Noble Foundation and the Farm Foundation and many partners back in 2013. It brings forward really an outstanding plan for needed research, measurement, and economics that will help accelerate the work of rebuilding our soil which is the bedrock of agricultural profitability, resilience, and sustainability. We've already invested and are investing in this space. Probably most importantly, we are bringing the work of our supply chain and our suppliers to bear to support the work of soil health in action uh, in a very pragmatic way. But we've also invested with all the partners that are represented here today, including the Soil Health Institute, uh, economically to uh, try and drive this agenda forward. And uh, we're pleased to see that other organizations have joined as well. You know, we see a value in the entire action plan. It's a very comprehensive document, a very comprehensive plan that has been put together by uh, some of the best minds in the country. But let me just highlight a few that we're particularly excited about. Wayne mentioned before the economics of managing for soil health which is very important, as Leonard just referred to, at the farm level, but equally as important at the community level and at the state and national level for policymakers. We're very excited about the research to enhance the productivity and resilience of farmers in the face of having to feed 10 billion people uh, in the very near future in this century. We're excited about the research to support improved water quality and excited about the research to quantify the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and carbon sequestration. You know, it's interesting, this is one of the very few business sectors that can actually sequester carbon uh, in the context of its normal day-to-day -day operation uh, with, in a very straightforward manner, without a lot of new technology, without a lot of significant capital investment, uh, this is one of the few sectors where that can really make a difference, and it's, uh, it's, will be, it's hugely promising and can be very beneficial to us as a society and uh, to the globe as well. We're also excited about the intent to develop a widely applicable measurement. This is really important work because this is very complex work. Um, it is also work that's being done in a very distributed part of the economy. It's a very decentralized part of the economy. And so having a measurement system that is pragmatic for the practitioners at the farm level, but that everybody agrees on, is really important so that we're all uh, pulling in the same direction. So we're very excited about that. And of course, we're very excited about the role the Institute wants to play in educating the broader public about the principal benefits of soil health. 
consumers will undoubtedly connect to more abundant food, to thriving rural communities that they're a part of, and to a healthier planet. And uh, the action plan is uh, clearly delivering on that. So let me just close by uh, reiterating what Leonard just said, that adding additional partners will be critical to achieve the scale necessary for this effort. Expanding soil health efforts is critical to the resilience of U.S. agriculture, U.S. rural economies, and the health of our planet. Thank you. It's great to be with you today. Thank you, Jerry, and I appreciate uh, the uh, depth in which you've, uh, you've uh, gone into how we can bridge that corporate commitment with SHIs, with the public-private partners. Um, to round out the full range of the partnership, we need to, to also look at that important relationship with the NGO community as well. And, and representing the entire NGO community today is uh, Michael Doan, uh, director of Working Lands for the Nature Conservancy. And uh, TNC has, has long been a partner in, uh, in conservation with NRCS, with several of the other partners that are out there, but has been an important player in this relationship with, uh, with uh, the uh, Soil Health Institute. Um, Michael is part of TNC's Global Lands Team. Uh, uh, Doan leads a team of the organization's foremost experts to scale up conservation outcomes across productively managed forests, ranching, farming, landscapes, um, and gives to TNC that practical knowledge of how to make that, that bridge that's out there. Um, he is, he's been a leader in uh, both field to market and the sustainability consortium on the sustainability side. I know active in the soil health partnership that Keith talked about, and then uh, now Soil Health Institute as well. With that, Michael Doan. Well, it's great to be with you today, and when you're sixth on the panel on a topic like this, sometimes you reflect and you think, well, maybe everything's been said that should be said, but it hasn't been said by me. So that's the kind of place I find myself, but this is such an important topic that there's just a little bit of space left that I intend to occupy today. And that is to tell you about the Nature Conservancy and why we would be standing on this stage with such a, a, a group of uh, uh, partners like this. And to do that, I want to tell you about the start of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, a little over 65 years ago, a group of citizen scientists in upstate New York identified a rare plant that they thought was so important that it must be preserved. They found in looking far and wide that this plant only existed in a few places. And in one of those places, they decided the best way to conserve that plant was to buy that land. Now, they had a problem, and that was they didn't have the money. So they mortgaged their houses, raised the money themselves, and started the modern land conservation movement, the land trust movement. And that's the business the Nature Conservancy has been in since. And it's now spawned many organizations who together have said there are places that are so important to protect that we must act. We must not act later. We must act now. And so that movement has matured. Today, the Conservancy is the largest conservation NGO in the world. We have 4,000 staff, 600 scientists. Uh, chapters in all 50 states led by committed conservationists who are community leaders, successful business people in their own right, but committed to the mission of conservation. We have programs in 60 countries around the world. And today, our mission has evolved. We've gone from looking at rare plants and rare places and special places. We still have a consistency for that. It's still part of our DNA. But our mission today reads like this, to conserve the land and water upon which all life depends. Now, that's a, that's a very big mission. And of course, we recognize that that mission does not happen by our hands alone. It happens in partnership. And so that's how we come to this stage today, as a partner, as a catalyst, as a committed partner, bringing our perspective to bear on this important issue. What I would also reflect on is the nature of our challenge. 
So if we think about that mission, conserving the land and water upon which all life depends, we are living through a time, a special time right now, where the growing demand for food and water and energy will be greater over the next two generations than any other generations prior to us. In the words of our great board trustee chairman, Tom Tierney, he calls this unequal time. We are living in unequal time. Now we think about time as being equal, but in the next two generations, we will have to cope with these challenges, but also with the tremendous headwind and the looming threat of climate change. How will we do that? We don't worry at the Nature Conservancy, we plan. We're, we have an um, overexpressed planning gene for conservation, we've said. And our plan is this. We believe in a positive, hopeful vision for the future where both pe people and nature thrive. And that can actually be together, not opposing, but actually one and the same. How do we do this? It starts by having a plan, having a vision, and then taking action. And that's why we're so inspired by the work of the Soul Health Institute and the action plan that has been delivered. In the way that we think about our unequal time, this plan is just in time. It is the right plan at the right time. But why would the Nature Conservancy be worried about soil health? We often are associated with interesting things like saving the elephants or other megafauna. So we've asked that question ourselves. We actually went through a planning process this last year, and it has been stated, and I just want to give a little color to this, that this represents one of the rarest win-wins that we see in this people and nature vision of how together nature supports people, people support nature, together we thrive. Just to add a little color to some of the points that have been made, if we would get 50% of the U.S. row crop land area to being managed for soil health, by our estimates, we would eliminate 116 additional million tons of soil erosion annually. We'd reduce 344 million pounds of nutrient loss to the environment. Uh, this is currently a big problem. Uh, many of our waterways are straining under the stress of sediment and nutrient loads that cause eutrophication, declining fisheries, clean water problems. Agriculture is a great um, part of our economy but we have unintended effects. We need to recognize those, and we think we can address them. We can also mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. The soil can act as a sink. It's been stated, but we estimate up to 25 million metric tons annually, and we can create 3.6 million acre feet of available water holding capacity just by getting to that tipping point of 50% of the land managed for soil health. So what's the problem? Unfortunately, today, this is a minority practice. We estimate it's not well monitored, but we estimate something less than 10% of U.S. cropland today is managed this way. And why would that be? Well, you have to go back to the action plan and the priorities have been established. There are important gaps in knowledge. Farming is very operational. Uh, farming for soil health requires new ways of farming, new operations. How does that work? There are also economic risks. Farmers are working on very thin margins right now. Our family farm, we understand this well. Keith has already mentioned it. But when you make these changes, there are economic risks. And these are livelihoods. These are people's livelihoods, their work. And so they need to know that the economics will work. And finally, uh, we haven't done enough to look at the policy and market levers that we could unlock to make this a more important priority. All of these things are teed up in the action plan, and we think that they're properly said uh, in that plan. One thing that I want to just say is we don't look at soil health as just one more thing that farmers should worry about, another thing on the checklist. In this way, we think about it as the first, the first thing, the primary thing. If we start to manage for soil health, everything else starts to happen in the right way. It becomes primary. Now, as I wrap up my comments, I want to just let you know I'm standing here as a conservationist, a committed conservationist. But I'm also a consumer. I'm an economist. I'm a farmer. I'm a parishioner. And I'm a father. Now, and some of you have some of those same titles. 
And I would say soul health gives us an opportunity from whatever angle we look at it. We think about this a lot as what's in it for the farmers. What we represent is also what's in it for society, what's in it for people. 7.4 7 billion people today, 10 billion people in the future. So TNC is proud to be a partner in this effort, and I want to just call out a few people here uh, for recognition. I think the NRCS deserves special recognition today. Uh, they have rightly uh, called attention to this agenda, and they have helped rally a lot of interest and support, which now is being catalyzed further. So thank you, Chief Jordan, for your comments and your work. The NCGA, uh, leading in the way they have, General Mills, a very progressive food company, putting this at the top of their agenda. And we are as well. Uh, privileged to say this is our priority. For U.S. agriculture, we see no other better alternative to address the conservation agenda and do it in a way that's good for people than focusing on soil health. So this plan deserves our full support and our full attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and I, uh, I appreciate uh, bat and cleanup, but finishing on a strong, uh, strong point. If I can invite the rest of the panelists uh, forward, and as they're, uh, as they're coming forward, you know, I, I can't help but remark on, you know, Michael talked about TNC, uh, you know, best known for helping to save the elephants and said he'd moved beyond that. Well, I got a soil health story for you to use on that, Michael. And, uh, and that is uh, Dr. Jerry Hatfield from the ARS had taught me a number of years ago that the sum total of all the critters in the soil, all the flora, the fauna, the mass and the weight of all those critical, of those critters in the soil are the equivalent of two elephants per acre in the Midwest. And so, Michael, you're still saving the elephants. <laughs> the stocking rate is two elephants per acre. And if we're following Keith Alverson's uh, instructions, I think we can take it to three. Um, with that, I've done the pitter-patter long enough for us to uh, open, the, uh, open the floor for questions. Um, we have microphones because we are uh, uh, recording and uh, webcasting. I'd ask everybody to use the microphones. So we've got a uh, first question here. Hi, Mike. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Stahlberg. I work with the Soil Science Society of America. I have a question for Dr. Honeycutt. Um, a national soil health assessment is very ambitious. Uh, it seems to me more like a means to an end than a goal in and of itself. And I was curious if you could Give some examples of the types of goals that having that assessment could address. It's goals that are here in the in the um, in the plan or other goals. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. For for one thing, the National Soil Health Assessment will allow any landowner uh, to really kind of determine where they are, and it would also allow us as a country to help identify where we need to really put those next investments to achieve the greatest impact, to achieve the greatest benefit with the limited amount of resources we have available. And then as I described earlier, understanding that current baseline, it allows us now to project what those additional benefits can be. If we're at one level now, if we raise that to X plus one or X times 10, uh, what can those additional benefits be in terms of water quality, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, providing pollinator habitat, all these additional environmental benefits too in our ability to grow that food for the burgeoning population. And so, and then over time, as we were to continue to follow with that National Soil Health Assessment, it would allow us to monitor our progress, to see how well we are doing at achieving these environmental benefits and goals, to see how well we are doing at achieving our ability to feed the world population. It's a living document. It is absolutely a living document, reflective of the soil itself. Do any of the, I know that the question was directed to uh, Dr. Honeycutt, but do any of the other panelists want to speak to the importance of the soil health assessment as a strategy in the, in the action plan? Well, let me follow up then. Uh, <laughs> when are we going to have this assessment? <laughs> well, you know, we are working right now on focusing on the soil health measures. Um, it does turn out that as, as nature is, there's a lot of complexities. Um, 
For example, if someone in Maine had an organic matter content of 1%, they might be crying because it's only 1%. Someone in, it, in uh, Georgia might be dancing in the street because it's up to 1%. And it's because of all the different factors that influence soils and the different properties that we have in soils. And so what that tells us is that we have to be uh, regionalized with our understanding of how to interpret these types of measures. And so one of our first steps is to develop those appropriate measures that are scientifically vetted, that are widely applicable, how we know how to interpret them so that we know what those thresholds are of different uh, measurements, different parameters to be measured in an overall comprehensive soil health evaluation. So once we can get to that, then we think that we will really be at that place where we can embark on a very comprehensive national soil health assessment. Now, I will say that we are not going to wait for the perfect. Uh, we feel like that there are uh, some measures that we currently know, uh, our scientists refer to them as tier one measurements uh, that the scientific community has already rallied around and agreed that these are ready for prime time. Uh, many of them are uh, already currently being used. But then there's a whole other suite where additional research needs to be done and what we're calling the tier two and tier three measurements. Many of them are biological measurements where we don't yet know how to interpret them. Um, some of them have been developed in one region of the country but not exploited or evaluated in other regions of the country. And so there's that additional research that needs to be done. So we do feel like that we want to get started using these tier one measurements and then expand and, uh, you know, really kind of uh, interpolate and, ex and information and interpret that information as we go, as those evaluations come. We do have a plan, sorry for the long-winded answer, uh, for uh, evaluating all those different types of measurements. What we've realized and pulled together is there are, a, there is a lot of uh, long-term agricultural experiment sites all around the country. So we've put out a call for detailed information on what those comparisons are at all those sites in the US, Canada, and Mexico. We're currently in the process of developing all the catalog of all those long-term sites. And then from that, we want to go to those particular sites, develop networks of those sites, and then go out and sample them and analyze them for those tier one, two, and three measurements to evaluate those new measurements and develop that comprehensive program for national deployment. Thank you very much. We've got a question here. If the uh, questioners could go ahead and identify themselves, and then Sheldon, after that, we've got another one over here. So. Steve Groff, cover crop coaching and farmer from southeastern Pennsylvania. A uh, question for you, Jerry, and there might be some follow-up from others. Um, General Mills is a very large corporation and you have uh, you know, many farmers feeding into that. My question is, what do you see as some of the challenges of implementing soil health practices at the farmer level? Yeah, thanks for the question. The, the challenges in, the, in this space are, have been talked a lot about today, uh, both from a scientific point of view, but also from a practical point of view. Um, we're very interested in, in getting to measurements and practices and outcomes at the end of the day. We really care about outcomes. Um, outcomes will help guide all of this work. If we define the kinds of outcomes that we want in a, in a, in a, in a very clear way, it allows the natural innovation that farmers and ranchers bring to their everyday operation to thrive. Um, and so I think one of, the, one of the most important things that's going to be done in this work is to get to really practical measures and practical tools that are simple for operators, for farmers and ranchers to be able to use and measure and guide their decisions. Um, it has to be something that can be implemented um, very easily. And, and I talk not as a farmer, actually. Keith, you probably talk to this much, much better than I can. But I think that's in a... In a in a challenge that is as complex as this one is, to make it very practical, simple, and economically valuable for farmers and ranchers is the most important thing that we can, that we can do in the next 10 years here. Jerry, I'm gonna ask you to expand a little bit. You, you spoke a lot about outcomes, mm -hmm. which is a, a term we use a lot in the sustainability community, but for our listeners, could you expand a little bit 
this, this whole concept of yeah. practice-based measures versus outcome-based measures, and uh, let's let's decamp that that debate just a touch so that folks understand. Yeah, you bet. So uh, outcomes are that we would care about, obviously, are productivity and profitability for the farmer and resilience. Um, and on the environmental side, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, water quality, uh, and resilience, water resilience, uh, as well as other types of resilience at the farm level. And if you said those are the outcomes that we want, thriving communities and a healthy planet defined by those, then there's lots of room for innovation in that, in that sphere, um, which is, uh, I think, probably the thing that we as a, as a society and American farmers and ranchers have always been really good at. Any of the other panelists want to chime yeah, in on yes, this one? I would love to because um, one of the things that we are just extremely uh, grateful for is the generous support of General Mills to help us really tease some of these measurement issues out. Um, which can't say enough of, of what that's going to do to really help us move forward um, in this area. And one of the things that we are doing is looking at these long-term sites is USDA Agriculture Research Service. They have sites they call GRACENET, stands for Greenhouse Gas Reduction Through Agricultural Carbon Enhancement Network. <laughs> I can't do it a second time. I did it the first time. Uh, but they have these long-term sites where they've been measuring these greenhouse gases. In many of these same types of practices they've been comparing, they probably they may not have been calling them soil health promoting or not at the time. They may have been calling them uh, with and without tillage or with and without manure. But essentially, these are some of these soil health promoting practices. And so it gives us that opportunity for not only evaluating these soil health measures on those sites to see how well these measures do at discerning differences in soil properties that are indicative of soil health, but it now take, allows us to take that next step and translate that into what those outcomes are. What does that mean for greenhouse gas reduction? By the same token, the USDA Ag Research Service and NRCS have sites they call SEEP, the Conservation Effects Assessment Project, watersheds, where they've monitored water quality with and without these conservation practices, with and without these soil health promoting practices and systems. And so again, that's gonna allow us, because we're gonna be sampling soils and evaluating these soil health measures on those sites, again, it's gonna allow us to relate those measures to those outcomes, to things in, this, in that case of water quality. And so the generous support that General Mills has given us to embark on this area, additional funding requests that we have out there, we're very hopeful for, and then, of course, the support, the foundational support we're receiving at the Institute from the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation is really uh, allowing us to move forward with our partnerships like TNC, um, Soil Health Partnership, General Mills, and others to really start to advance this, this issue. Uh, Mr. Buckner and then uh, Keith. I think a, a couple things, Steve, and, and you're well aware of this because um, you know, you're a big champion for soil health and you've talked to producers every single day around the world. But I think one of the things is that we have to approach this with some measured patience and recognizing that farmers um, really need to talk to farmers and have that experience that they can um, rely on one another for helping them reduce that risk um, assessment, if you will. The conservation districts have identified 150 soil health champions across the country that we ought to be tapping into that resource. These guys are passionate, they're, but they're patient, and they, they'll work with producers every day to, to let them take that first step. And then our work is, is, as I called earlier, the grunt work. It's to get everything back up so we can begin to, to understand what those metrics are so we can hand those to them so they can get a baseline um, about where they currently stand. But that doesn't mean they don't stop to work with cover crops and begin to understand the benefits of what they're trying to get done. And, um, and so uh, farmer to farmer is, is always the best route. And I think we'll get there eventually. Um, I'm pleased to see um, Unilever is jumping into the middle of this too, wanting to um, invest money to expand cover crop acreages, another 30 million acres over and above the SARE goal of 20 million. We see great things coming out of this, and so the awareness and in in what the Soil Health Partnership is doing is really verifying the benefits of cover crops and how it enhances soil health. And all that information that Nick Geiser and his group are going to do, all the work that the conservation districts are doing, those champions, I think it's going to move this thing fairly rapidly. But we have to do it with, with some measured patience. Keith Albers. 
Yeah, um, just from a farm perspective, I guess one of the things that we've always believed is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And so this action plan, I think, really epitomizes the measurement end of things. And so once we determine these measurements and uh, can get that on a broad scale, then we at the farm level can actually make management decisions and make practice changes or, or, or practice tweaks based on, on the measurements that, that were recorded and what outcomes that we would like to see or what the, I guess, the low-hanging fruit or what opportunities are presented in each different region or each different farm. Okay, now let's go back out for another, another question. Uh, Debbie Reed. Thanks, Bruce. Debbie Reed with the Coalition on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases. Uh, we focus on building environmental service markets for the agricultural sector um, and engaging farmers so that they have the tools to actually participate. So my question is about the measurement piece, so nice segue with the previous questions. Um, in both carbon offset markets and environmental service markets, the one thing we have grappled with is measurement systems that are rigorous enough for markets, but simple enough to actually be useful on the ground with our farmer and rancher partners. For your measurements, um, I haven't uh, looked at the report yet, but for the measurement systems, we have been adapting research-based tools such as biogeochemical process models um, for use in these markets. Have you given thought to um, tools that can be scalable and cost-effective and useful on the ground to help monetize a lot of these attributes? That's question one. And question two um, is a little bit simpler. Uh, we, we manage soils uh, structurally to T, right, the, the structural um, uh, measurement of erosion. C have you given thought or can you give thought to managing soils to soil organic matter? Because that, in fact, reduces erosion both from wind and precipitation, we know. And I think, it, it, you know, all of the speakers spoke to this very eloquently. Um, soil organic matter is, in fact, what we should be managing to. Can we change policy to do that? Boy, am I glad I'm just moderating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's taking this one? I'll jump in and try the first couple. Okay. And I think Chief Jordan's ready to oh, jump in. Ready? I did the second part. Oh, okay. oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I'd assumed everyone else was hiding under the table, and I had to. Uh, thank you very much, Debbie. Um, one of the things that you will find in our action plan to the extent of monetizing soil health, I did not describe it in my presentation, is that is also one, it's the third priority in our economics uh, section, is uh, we recognize there's a tremendous opportunity from various perspectives for monetizing soil health. One of them is to, uh, to help provide that foundational knowledge and information and those processes and measurements needed for supporting carbon uh, markets, uh, water quality markets, other types of environmental markets. Um, we see other opportunities there in monetization in terms of when it comes to land valuation. If a farmer or rancher uh, can demonstrate that they have higher organic carbon and therefore their land might, you know, achieve a premium, uh, might be valued higher because now it's more productive, more resilient. Uh, we think that is a way to get additional voluntary conservation measures in place that do not require financial assistance and incentive to do it uh, because that is their incentive to do it. Uh, then there's other aspects of monetization, not just for the farmer, but for society um, because of the, all of the public value of things like you know, clean water, for example, trying to really kind of monetize that. And so all of this really contributes uh, to, um, to your question, I think, about kind of monetizing these for these environmental markets. Now, when it comes down to the specific mechanisms or models or processes um, that are now accepted by the uh, market community and the market design, um, that is where we need to start sitting down with people like yourself uh, that can help educate people like me in the soil science community about those types of limitations, restrictions, requirements that are needed, uh, what types of aggregation is needed, uh, accepted. Um, it's my understanding from some of the work uh, that was done a couple of years ago uh, in the Global Climate Change Office with developing uh, standards for uh, measuring CO2 and those types of things. Um, it's my understanding that that 
as long as the markets know what that measurement is, then they can pretty much get behind it. Maybe that's too simple of, a, of, a, of an understanding, but uh, that was the understanding that I had. So I would really like to work with you uh, more closely um, on that. And I understand you're coming to uh, a workshop that the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation is having in a few weeks and is going to be presenting there. And we're really happy to have you presenting it at our, at our annual meeting in July, uh, too, on this, on this effort. So thanks. You're, okay, I can't remember what her second question was. But so I I'll turn did, it Chief over to you. Jordan. Okay. So let me try it, and then if I fail, then I will right. I'll come back at you. Okay. okay. So I, I don't know if I'm going to answer it directly, but I'm going to I'm going to make an attempt, and that is you made reference to T, and and I think I want to emphasize that as as we as as a member of this partnership, it is an agency that they work with private individuals voluntarily. I've I've a primary focus and goal is to help that producer, he or she, to meet their objectives. As an example, over the last two years or so, we've we put soil health type practices in over 40 million acres across this country. I, I grant you that a predominance of those acres, if not 90% of those, have been in situations that T wasn't a concern. It, it was a more about a management system that enable that producer, he or she, to meet their objectives. Now, it, and also, we have this whole suite of soil scientists and a little bit on the, the variab variability of soils across the country. We have this whole network of, of soil scientists in various parts they, all over this country. And so they are working to look at our practices to see what, how, what contributions our practices are making to organic matter and other things along those lines. So we are not solely focusing on tea, and I, I think you know that, but we are trying to focus to meet the landowner's objective. And for instance, it could be a cover crop, a cocktail mix, it could be a crop and rotation, a suite of things, but we are continually trying to refine our toolbox of practices to better align with what those landowner's needs and objectives are and, and many of them are speaking volumes that they want to do something in this whole soil health arena. So that's the direction we're on, and we're trying to, again, fine-tune our toolbox to make sure that we are as accommodating as we possibly can. T is not the control. Any other contributions from the panel on this one? I'll tell you, I personally, I've got a Star Trek objective on this. Um, which is uh, soil health measurement eventually. You have a tricorder that Dr. Honeycutt instead of Dr. Bones, wave it over the soil and you can say, Captain Kirk, it's a healthy soil. That's where we need to be. <laughs> Next question. Hi, Dan Morgan. I'm an independent writer. Uh, a lot of talk about carbon, generally speaking, when we talk about soil and uh, agriculture, but I'm wondering if, you, if somebody could address the question of how do you incentivize uh, the NOx side of this? Remember, the Chicago Climate Exchange, when it was in existence, had, um, had a carbon uh, uh, contract. Uh, NFU was involved in, in uh, uh, operating in that, National Farmers Union. Uh, but, they, but the nitrogen question seems to me even more complicated in terms of developing a, uh, you know, some kind of a contract that would incentivize farmers. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, what progress has been made on that, if, uh, you know, where, where we are on that. Uh, it, it seems like it's a measurement, it's a, it's a, it's a ticklish and difficult measurement uh, problem in the sense that, uh, how do you do it? You measure the amount of nitrates in the water coming off a farm or out of a county? Do you measure uh, uh, the amount of, 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 of ammonia fertilizer and nitrogen fertilizer going on a farmer's fields and then just uh, take a, uh, a, a percentage of that and figure that a certain amount of that is going to go out as nitrous, nitrous oxide. Uh, that would get into the problem of uh, how much you're, you're immobilizing in that field through the corn itself or, or whatever crop you're growing there. Uh, it's a tough measurement problem, it seems to me, and I'm wondering if anybody has, uh, has come up with something like a uh, you know, a, an agreed upon way of doing it. So there are uh, existing models uh, for measuring nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, that this one model called DNDC, decomposition uh, 
uh, denitrification decomposition model is one way that's uh, generally accepted. It's not perfect, as is no, any model is not perfect. It's just an approximation of what we know, uh, our best you know, ability to understand those relationships that are driving those processes. Um, but I would say that uh, one of the things that we've recognized in our action plan and have called out is uh, improving nutrient use efficiency, enhancing water quality by improving nutrient use efficiency. And so that means understanding all these processes and all those drivers. And when we, uh, for example, change tillage operations or if we now we're using cover crops, particularly if it's a legume in the cover crop, then that means now we need to alter our fertilizer recommendations because that legume has the ability to bring in, you know, bring in nitrogen out of the atmosphere to the soil. And so uh, it's what we really look at in, in uh, Soil Health Institute is looking at this as a whole systems perspective. And uh, that would involve uh, improving nutrient use efficiency for all those nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and all of them. And so nitrogen is a very uh, tricky one. It, for years, it is has plagued scientists with being able to track and being able to optimize. Um, but I do feel like that um, our, our science has moved us to a point now where we're really starting to understand a lot of these relationships and interactions more and more. Uh, the vagaries of the weather have a very strong influence, particularly the, the element that you call out with when denitrification really responds to a wetting event. And you can get very, very little loss of nitrogen to the atmosphere through denitrification uh, until now you get a heavy rain and now you can lose a big slog of it. And so there are those uh, difficulties, but to the extent that we can continue to armor the soil with crop residue, uh, use cover crops to take up the excess nitrate uh, so that it does not denitrify, uh, then we can, I feel like we can make some very strong advances in that area. Bill Buckner? Yeah, Dan, that's, that's a great question. And um, I made a comment earlier about the uh, the new Aggies from Silicon Valley. And your Star Wars, uh, Star mm -hmm. Trek analogy is not that far off. Um, there's some really brilliant people working in this space that are really looking at real-time diagnostics um, that are coming out of the the human side of the, of the equation, but then also the sensor technology is advancing itself rapidly. And um, there's a, a company that's working with a, a, a diagnostic panel today then in selling it. There's two ladies from Stanford University that started this little startup. They're, I think they're really going to make some great strides in it. Um, there's a, an Irish company that's looking um, with a, some sort of a biological agent that can clean up heavy metals in soil, and, and, they, and that's their intended purpose. And then there's others that are creating the magic wand with sensors that are laced on it, and there are augers that are um, drilled down to the soil as deep as you want to go that can measure anything. And so I, I think what they need is guidance and advice from the ag community on, on how to bring these types of technologies to the market. And, and work with them and, and get those individuals, as I talked about earlier, that are venture capitalists that want to do impact investing and they will invest in these technologies if there's a common good, as we talked about today, for all of mankind through this benefit. So I, I'm, I'm really bullish on the future of what we see there and, um, and I think we'll be able to do it in relatively a decent period of time. Excellent, I'm gonna move us along so we make sure we get all these questions in. So this is really a follow up Rich Deuceraus, National Soil Safety Conservation Districts. Somewhat of a follow-up on the coalition question earlier regarding T, and Leonard may have partially addressed it, but let me start with him and anyone else on the panel, because what you alluded to is the network of thousands of technicians and conservation planners in both the conservation districts and RCS and the private sector who are out there today helping farmers adopt these new practices. Uh, how are you prepared to adjust the field office tech guide and the uh, standards and tools that are out there that guide that technical advice that is given to the producer? Are we prepared to move forward with some of these new scientific findings so that we can more quickly get that in the hands of the decision makers, those farmers, the objectives you spoke to of trying to help that farmer uh, reach their objectives? Well, of course, you know, you can't be stagnant and be successful, right? So we continue to pursue and look for opportunities to improve our, our suite of tools. Uh, we I mentioned about the network of soil scientists and others that we have. They're continuing looking at the existing practice that we have. 
It's not to say that the practices that we have in a tech guide today doesn't contribute significantly, but we need to better identify their contributions and, and capture that. I think that's the first step, and we are working aggressively to try to do that. And then, of course, if there's an introduction to other tools that could serve in that role, then yes, we are more than open to taking a look at those practices and go through our process of incorporating them into that, into our tech guide. Got that makes one sense. One more question over here, and then I've got one over on this side. So, so this is this is just you're good. Just go ahead. Okay, so, uh, Sally Schneider, USDA's Agricultural Research Service, and this is more of a, a comment and a request, maybe than an actual question. Wayne mentioned both our GraceNet and our SEEP networks, but we also have another network, the Long Term Agro Ecosystem Research Platform. And that has 18 different sites ranging across the country from the mountains of, of Idaho to the Mississippi watershed, to the Chesapeake, to the coastal plains of the southeast. And that was actually initiated by Steve Schaefer when he was still with ARS. And as this partnership moves forward to implement this action plan, I, I guess I just request that you keep in mind the role that the LTAR might play in moving all of this forward. Each location will be part of a common experiment that has both a business as usual treatment and an aspirational treatment at it. And it could well be a, a just perfect place to document, measure, evaluate the progresses that we're making. I want to reassure you, you're on our list already. Excellent, excellent. We've got the uh, last question over here, and then I want to warn the panelists. We haven't scripted how we're closing things up, so I'm going to ask one last question of the panelists, and I want you to each tell me what you like best in the action plan. So uh, I'm giving them a little for forewarning what's coming at them, uh, but Tom. Thanks. I'm Tom Brolsma with the International Plant Nutrition Institute, and I guess my question is probably mostly for Wayne Honeycutt and Leonard Jordan there. Um, and it's a fairly delicate one because um, it, it seems to be emerging that the practices for soil health that have been very successful in reducing loss of the particulate form of phosphorus uh, may have unintended consequences for the dissolved form, and which raises a complexity as to how, how are we going to um, uh, recognize, measure, address outcome-based management and the impact where dissolved phosphorus uh, is an important impact on the environment. Is it going to be incorporated into the models? Uh, is it going to be part of the uh, research agenda that's being called for? Is it going to be part of the research budget of SHI? Thanks. Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, as you well point out, um, Bob, managing for the particulate uh, phosphorus, it's that phosphorus that is bound to soil particles which traditionally has been the management approach. By controlling erosion, then we've always assumed, and, and plenty of research and measurement has borne this out, uh, that we are controlling for that loss of phosphorus. But as you well point out, there is increasingly recognized, in what I'm particularly thinking in the Western Lake Erie Basin, mm -hmm. where they're finding uh, soluble phosphorus now coming out of the drain tile lines that, that's, that's making its way in, into the lake and, and other water bodies. And so for us, we don't see ourselves as putting on lab coats or going out and, and making these measurements. But what we do see ourselves is doing is providing the strategy, the actions, the actionable steps that need to be addressed, and then trying to bring in the funding and then get that funding back out to the door to the qualified scientists and field practitioners that are highly qualified for making those measurements, for evaluating those models, uh, for coming up with the uh, best practices that will allow us to enhance soil health and also uh, in an environmentally responsible manner that protect water quality. And so um, I can't tell you that I know the exact model that should be used right now, because I don't know uh, what that is right now. But I would tell you that in our efforts for improving nutrient use efficiency, that we would just not be considering nitrogen. We would also be looking at phosphorus and other elements that um, might find their way into our waterways. Chief Jordan. Yes. Oh. So I can't say we have an exact answer to that, but what we are doing is we are leveraging with some of our partners uh, through, for instance, the Conservation Innovation Grants 
and we are putting out proposals, requests, and we get uh, information, feedback, and interest in the form of proposals for various entities that indeed are looking at, at some of those concerns for which you just expressed. So that's, that's one of the, the ways that as an agency we began to try to explore and scope out uh, what those potential concerns are and if there are meaningful ways for which those concerns can be addressed. So we are leveraging. So um, I'll add one last thing just as a moderator's prerogative. This is a wonderful challenge to have yeah. because we are solving one part of the phosphorus problem, which is then exposing another component of the phosphorus problem that had been overlooked in the past. And we can in turn turn the resources to being able to do that. That can come from SHI, can come from the federal partners that we have. But this is a wonderful problem to have because we are making progress. And that's so much of what we're trying to do with this entire action plan. So last word from each of the panelists. You've all looked at the action plan. What are you most excited about? What do you most want to see go into the uh, implementation stage on that? And uh, we're going to start at the far end with uh, Michael Dell. Um, I'm actually going to answer this in a way because we've had so much discussion on measurement. Uh, the panelists up here know that I'm, I'm big on that one, but we've had such a good discussion. I'm going to put a point on something else that I think is vital, and that is um, as taxpayers, uh, we have a farm bill coming up. We have policy that could be better attuned to this very important priority. It's called out in the action plan. Uh, the time is now. The time isn't 10 years from now. Uh, we need to build a much stronger coalition, and it isn't just the farm community. It's conservationists, it's community leaders, uh, it's food companies. Um, we have a wonderful agency, an NRCS, that is very willing to do more on this. Uh, we need to give that direction as a, as a citizenry, and so that's the thing that I would really point to that is really right here in the action plan. Okay. Jerry? So I think we're most excited about the outcome potential of the action plan. Uh, we talked about outcomes earlier. And the, the potential for farmers and ranchers and rural communities to be more profitable, uh, more resilient, and more sustainable for the long term, because we all, we all depend on that. Chief well, Jordan. I'm going to say ditto. <laughs> I, I think our interest is, is along the lines of outcomes as well. Because for 80 some years, we put suites of practices out on the landscape and it's a, it's a big secret yet in terms of what the true values and benefits of those practices are. So I think this, this will afford the opportunity for the public uh, to, to recognize the true value of the conservation practices and the systems of practices that, that are on the landscape. And then it, as a result of that, hopefully, there's a greater, uh, there's greater credibility and, and respect for the role that conservation plays in society. Excellent, excellent. Keith Alverson. Uh, you know, I'm, I would have to, to agree with the two gentlemen to my left here that uh, having information to make management decisions on a farm level is, is first and foremost very important to me. You know, trying to determine what the, um, is, is most achievable to improve the soil health in different regions and you know on each individual farm is something that's critical and something that each of us as farmers struggle with on what uh, what management decision and what management change that uh, uh, we would like to see and what kind of outcome we would like to see but I think it, in an overarching aspect I think that the the action plan and you know just the national recognition and that this is bringing to the importance of soil health is something that's important to us as a commodity organization and uh, the recognition of uh, you know the, the importance of soil health for not only our growers but uh, for us as a nation and the community. Dr. Honeycutt? The thing I'm most uh, I think pleased with is that although it was some challenge it was took some struggles uh, to work through to identify the specific actionable steps to achieve some of these goals and address some of these key gaps and priorities. Um, I have nothing against strategic plans. <laughs> I love strategic plans, but most strategic plans are, are, are more general. 
And, but that's okay, that's what they're meant for. They're meant for a more of perhaps an external audience of a given organization. Uh, but then it's usually kind of left up to filling in the detail later. And what we strive for here was really kind of uh, filling in that detail now so that we knew what those concrete next steps were so that when we go to a potential funder and talk to them about how soil health can help them meet their mission, whether it's water quality or climate change or productivity, then we can lead them through those actionable steps that we see need to be done. Bill? I'm gonna sneak in too. Um, like Michael, I'm, I'm real excited about the measurement component. Um, what comes with that though is the calibration of our nation's soil testing labs uh, on a state-by-state -state basis. They haven't been calibrated in many cases since the light, late 1950s, 1960s. We don't know exactly what the cost of calibration is going to be on a nationwide scale, but as we lift up and we begin to establish these metrics, we also have to help the labs and, and come up to some standards that we can calibrate across the country that gives us some level of standardization that we can all live with. There's so much variability in the testing out there that I think this is a real opportunity to bring all these together. But here's my, what I'm most excited about. To really get this out there and working effectively and with the education process, it takes the ag retailers to really be involved and I think they're, they're looking for opportunities, but there's one other group that's even looking for the greater opportunity and they'll hold the most promise for us and that's our conservation districts. They were created for a purpose. And a lot of them work very effectively and a lot of them don't work very effectively. A lot of states give a lot of support and there's a lot of states that don't provide any support. I'm hopeful that this action plan really gives the lift that we need so we can, on a county by county basis across the country, mobilize the conservation districts to allow them to do their work and work with the farmers, work with the retailers that are in the area and I think we can really advance soil health in a meaningful way. Thank you very much. I, uh, I'd ask you all to join me in a round of applause for our panelists. We appreciate very much everyone joining us this morning. Thanks again to Dr. Honeycutt, his team for having put together the vision of this action plan. Uh, my thanks to all the panelists for their stake in this, their contribution to it. The, the vision that Bill Buckner provided to, uh, to this in taking a organic movement and moving it forward in a way that is measurable, chan challengeable, and Farm Foundation for that to work as well. Because it, were it not for Farm Foundation and Noble's partnership, we could not be here today. With that, thank you very much. There's refreshments in the back of the room. We do have to be out of the room by 11 o'clock. So thank you very much. <laughs> Eat and drink fast. Eat and drink fast. <laughs>